get in here. So molecular cloning is one of the most important techniques in molecular biology and biochemistry. Um, so today I want to give you an overview of some of the techniques and the typical workflow. So first of all, let's clarify what we're talking about. I am not talking about making a bunch of copies of your dog. Instead, I'm talking about, when we talk about molecular cloning, we're talking about taking like a single piece of genetic information, like maybe the instructions for making a protein, the gene for making a protein. And we're gonna stick that in somewhere that's easier to work with, um, typically a circular piece of DNA um, called a plasmid vector. Um, and then we can get like stick that into bacteria and get the bacteria to make lots of copies for us. And we can even get the um, bacteria to make the protein or get it clone it into others, put it in other type cell types to make proteins. Um, so I'm not gonna go into that complicated stuff, um, but even if you end up expressing it in a different cell type, you often have to do molecular cloning um, and getting bacteria to make lots of copies of your sequences and that sort of thing. Um, and so this molecular cloning is really important. The actual process of taking that um, gene or that genetic information um, and sticking it into a plasmid um, and then making sure that it actually worked. Um, and so a couple of the main strategies that we can use for this are like restriction cloning um, and PCR-based methods like SLIC, which is what I use most, the sequence and ligation independent cloning. So I'll go into more details about um, these various processes. Um, but first, let's all just like get on the same track in terms of terminology and some of those sort of things. Um, so we can clone in like anything um, and so often when we're talk, we're doing the um, cloning, we're talking about taking a um, like the cDNA for a protein. So cDNA stands for complementary DNA, and it's a version of DNA that is the complement of mature messenger RNA. Um, so the genetic instructions for making a protein are written in the DNA for, in the form of a gene. Um, that gene is then transcribed into a messenger RNA copy, and that messenger RNA copy is translated into a protein. But before that messenger RNA is translated, it gets edited, it has its regulatory intron regions cut out um, in a process called splicing. Um, and so the mature messenger RNA isn't going to have all that regulatory information um, that isn't needed by the ribosome, the protein making machinery, and that they, they wouldn't understand anyway. Um, so you want to remove that. And so then when you make a DNA copy of that stick into your plasmid, you want to put make it sure that you have the cDNA, the complementary DNA. So it's corresponding to the mature messenger RNA and not this like immature one um, with the intron still in there. Um, so this would be your cDNA. But you can also stick in like anything. And so a lot of times, especially um, if people are trying to study like a bigger region, um, you see like plasmid libraries, especially in a lot of older papers, they would like chop up regions um, and clone them into um, various plasmid vectors um, in order to kind of just like have copies of large parts of the genome that they can then test for things. So you can clone in anything. And so we can refer to this part as just like the insert. And then the other part is going to be like your vector. Um, and so the, it's, which is served as like a vehicle for getting this sequence into um, like bacterial cells or um, typically, which is what we're going to talk about here. Sorry, I'm doing an experiment. Okay. So when you have, um, what is in this vector? Um, and so in a, this vector is gonna have a few important things. So it's gonna have um, the information, like, so if you're doing a protein expression, um, you are going to have like a promoter sequence which is going to allow for the transcription and subsequent translation, which are coupled in bacteria. Um, it's also gonna have an origin of, um, so like, so that, um, DNA polymerase can make copies of this, um, so it's not going to integrate with the um, the host. Um, it's going to a plasmid is basically it's like replicates outside of the host DNA, so it'll hang out outside. And then this really important thing that we'll talk about is the selection marker, such as an antibiotic resistance gene, that's going to allow for selection of the cells with your plasmid. Um, and, but this selection marker isn't going to tell you if the, um, so basically how the selection marker works is that when we stick this um, into cells in a process called transformation, um, then only the cells that have the plasmid are going to be able to grow and replicate um, because they have the antibiotic selection gene. 
Um, and then because, um, but that doesn't tell you that the sequence is right. And so then we have different techniques that we can use, um, like colony PCR or analytical digest to get an idea if it's okay. Um, and then we can send it for sequencing in order to really um, make sure that the sequence is correct. Um, so how do we get the sequence in there though? That is the, that's the main thing we want to talk about today. Um, so as I mentioned, there are a couple of main techniques. So there's like restriction cloning um, and um, like slick or similar methods. There's a lot of different methods, like um, there's some like proprietary methods or whatever, but the tech, the basic concepts are very similar. Um, with restriction cloning, basically, I like to think of it as kind of like cutting and pasting. And then with Slick, it's kind of like copy and stapling. Um, so you're making a bunch of copies and getting bacteria to stitch them together. Um, and so this is like, um, you're using like PCR here. Um, here, you're not necessarily using PCR. You can use PCR to make lots of copies of the insert. Um, so let's go into a little more detail about what I mean. Okay, so restriction cloning. Um, so this is gonna use restriction um, enzymes, which are site-specific endonucleases. Um, and so basically what they're going to do is they're going to recognize specific sequences in double-stranded DNA um, and cut them. But they recognize different sequences. So like ECOR5 is going to um, make recognize this sequence and it's going to cut straight. Um, but a lot of, so we call these like blunt ends. Um, but often what we're using when we're doing cloning are these like um, these restriction enzymes that are going to do these staggered cuts, which are going to produce these sticky ends. So basically what we can do is we can have, we can um, cut, we can, often the plasmids will come with um, sequences on either side. Like you have like this multi-cloning site sequence or site, like an MCS, um, which often has like multiple different restriction enzyme sites um, so that you can kind of like easily stick your gene in if it has one of the sequences and you can also um, introduce like silent mutations and stuff into your sequence um, in order to introduce cut sites. And so more on that in other posts. Um, but the, so basically you want to cut both the, um, your sequence, your insert sequence and your, um, vector sequence, um, with the same, or at least, um, complementary sticky ends, uh, or, um, enzymes that'll make comp like the same cut ends. Um, so sometimes there are restriction enzymes that'll make, have the same like overhang, even if the sequence is, um, like a little different, it's, kind of, it's hard to explain, um, but you need to have um, the, the overhangs need to be the same so that they can get stitched together. And there are also ways you can do things with blunt ends, but we're not going to talk about that. Um, but this idea is very similar. Okay, so basically this is showing an example where we're sub cloning. So our insert is already in one thing and we wanna stick it in some other thing. Um, this is really common, um, especially nowadays um, where you will order like a plasmid from like adgene or some sort of plasmid repository. And or maybe you email the authors of a paper um, to get the one that they use, but then you just want the gene. Like you don't want the actual or the cDNA, I guess. You don't want the actual like plasmid, like maybe they have a plasmid for expressing it in um, like mammalian cells and you just wanna make it in bacteria or something. I don't know, but you wanna stick it in some sort of other plasmid. So this is really common. A lot of times you can even like with cDNA libraries and stuff, they'll just give it a Q in like a kind of like generic plasmid that's good for just making copies in bacteria, but not much else. Um, so you want to sub clone it. So you want to like clone it out of there and then like put it into another vector. Um, so basically you're gonna want to cut these with um, matching enzymes um, so that they'll have these complementary sticky ends and then you can mix and match them. Um, then you can purify the pieces you want um, and then get them, stitch them together. So this purifying the pieces that you want, you're gonna do this by like um, gel purification um, so basically you do your cutting, um, but then you're going to have the big pieces and the little pieces and you want one of the like, little pieces and one of the big pieces. Um, or similarly, um, and then you're going to have to isolate the pieces that you want um, and get rid of the pieces that you don't want. And so you can use um, this for do like this gel purification. Um, so basically you run an agarose gel, which is going to separate those pieces by size.
Um, and then what you're actually going to do is you're going to cut out the pieces and um, and get the DNA out of them. And so there are like kits and stuff that'll help you do this. Um, but so the basic idea is that you're purifying these pieces out. They have these complementary ends, but these ends have like holes. Um, and so these ends are going to need to get stitched together. Um, and this can be done by DNA ligase, um, which can stitch together those ends. And then you stick it in bacteria and the bacteria um, are happy um, and they'll make lots and lots of copies of this plasmid because it's got like that origin of replication and that sort of thing. Um, there are a lot of different strains of bacteria you could um, stick in, which some of them make more copies, some of them make less copies, various things. Um, I'm not going to get into in this post. What I do want to mention though is that um, where is that insert coming from? Um, so instead of cutting it out of one of the, so instead of like so a, a, down back, a drawback of the restriction cloning method is that you need a lot of both of them. Like you are not making copies if you do it just like this. Um, so basically you have to get the bacteria to make a lot of copies of these plasmids or whatever. And then you purify the whole thing out with like a mini prep kit um, and then you cut it up um, and use the pieces. But you basically you need a lot because you're not making copies in the process. You're just, you already needed the bacteria to make the copies for you type of thing. This will make more sense when we talk about the PCR-based methods. Speaking of which, we can get, instead of having the bacteria just make tons and tons of copies of this other plasmid that we wanna get our insert out of, um, we can make PCR copies of the insert. And so this is also good if you're, say, you have, you don't want to, you don't have a restriction site in the sequence that you want. Um, to use and so you want to introduce like new sequences on the ends of the piece that you want um so you're kind of like introducing a site at the end after your game um or if it's part of a longer thing that you don't want um so there are various things like you could just you can imagine that you want to just have it in a ready to go format where it's got these cloning sites on either side and so that way you can use like pcr based methods and so there are a lot of um there are some different companies and stuff that have different like proprietary ones where they have um, various, I don't know, cloning strategies um, that are based on something similar. Where so you have, um, you can make PCR copies of the insert um, and use the primers to add the cut size to you want. And so with PCR, basically you have these little pieces of DNA um, called these um, primers and then they're going to basically bookend the region you want copied um, and then the DNA polymerase will make lots and lots of copies of the bookended region um, and so much more on this in other posts so I'm not going to go into it but you can the primers in a, they have to have some region that's going to correspond with where you want like your actual sequence that you have to start with but you can introduce, um, you can add on to the primer, so you can make the primers kind of like longer, um, so that they have sequences on the end that are going to have restriction enzyme cut sites. Um, and then you can um, digest that with the restriction enzymes, um, and now you are, um, you have sticky ends. Um, and so that's a strategy that you can use um, in the cloning. And so this is going to make lots of copies of the PCR step. Um, and it's going to have the cut sites. Okay. Um, one thing to note here is that this cutting is going to leave you with phosphorylated ends. Um, but the primers, when you buy the primers, these are not, these are going to be um, usually synthesized without the phosphates. Um, and so in this, if you weren't like cutting it, say, um, then you wouldn't have these, these phosphates. Um, and this is only going to come into play if your vector is dephosphorylated. Um, so phosphorylation may or may not affect things and you may or may not need to phosphorylate things. Um, and so if you're using a um, single restriction enzyme, um, REAs, the restriction endonuclease, um, then you're gonna need to phosphorylate your vector to prevent self-circulation, self-circularization. So if you use the same enzyme on, uh, to cut on either side of your insert, now it's going to have sticky ends for itself. And so when you add the ligand, and these sticky ends are going to have phosphate groups because when these, these restriction enzymes cut, they're gonna leave the phosphate groups. And so when you add the ligase, then it's going to self-ligate. 
since the, you also have the antibiotic resistance gene in here, this plasmin, if it gets into cells, it can survive, but it doesn't have your gene. So you can prevent the circularization um, by dephosphorylating the ends. Um, and so if you do the, if this dephosphorylation, now the ligase can't stitch them together because it needed that, um, it needed that phosphate group um, in order to stitch the ends together. And if it doesn't have it, then it's not gonna be able to do that. Um, but you need your insert to be phosphorylated. Um, and then you will still have, so although you add the ligase, you're still gonna have like a couple of nicks, um, but the bacteria um, can then fix it. Um, and so just know what, what you're dealing with um, and whether or not you are going to need um, to, do, um, to do the um, dephosphorylation or phosphorylation. And if you need to do phosphorylation, um, you can, we can do this easily with like a polynucleotide kinase. Um, so this is how we do like more U radio labeling. Um, we can add like radio labeled phosphate groups, um, but that's not what we're doing with the here. So the met that's um, so restriction cloning is a really common method that's used. Um, one other caveat with it is you wanna make sure that you don't have um, like cut sites elsewhere in the plasmid or in your insert um, for that enzyme. And so that could, then you would have multiple pieces um, and not like your full length thing. Um, so that's another thing to be aware of. The method that I actually use um, when I'm cloning is slick. Um, so sequence and ligation independent cloning. Um, and so with slick, um, basically you're doing PCR of the insert piece and the vector piece with overlapping regions on the ends. So this is kind of similar to what this starting point is kind of similar to what I was talking about before is how you can like introduce um, sequences in your primers. Except in here, instead of adding sequences with cut sites, we're adding sequences that match the thing that we want to stick it into. So we're going to basically have sequences that overlap on the ends. Um, and so, and here, so you're designing your primers to have flanking bits on the vector sequence on their ends. Um, and so here, with this is the vector you want to put in, such as a plasmid. Um, and so basically, you're going to basically just copy it as is. But these regions of the plasmid on the ends where you want to want you want to stick in your other thing, you're going to um, put those regions on the ends of the primers that you're going to use to copy your insert. So now you have parts that match on either side. But you have like if you were to just like stitch these together, then you'd have like double the region, right? You'd have like two of these blue things and then two of this um, this blue part. Um, so that wouldn't be good. Plus you needed a way to like stitch them together. Um, so what's going to happen is instead what we're going to do is we're going to use T4 polymerase. I know it's kind of confusing because the polymerase is something that adds DNA letters and now we're talking about it removing letters. But it turns out that this polymerase has this like exonuclease function too. Um, and so if you don't give it DNA letters, um, it'll kind of like revert to its kind of like proofreading type thing and just like start removing letters. Um, so it's gonna chew them back a little. We don't give, we only give it um, a little bit of time so we can't do, like over chew. Um, but so make you, you make these primers so it's long enough that when you chew, when it chews back, so it's only chewing one of these strands and it's gonna chew back in a way that's basically leaving you overhanging, um, complementary overhangs. Um, and then when you mix these together, what's going to happen is that the bacteria are going to be smart and they're going to say, aha, those pieces match. Um, and so when you basically, when you mix these pieces together, they're going to kind of stitch together, um, but not really. Um, and because you have like different amounts of chewing and various things, um, but there, it's enough that it can kind of like stick together and help with, with have some holes. And then the bacteria is going to help um, fill in the gaps. And so you don't need to pre-ligate it. Um, so this is where the, the lick part comes in, um, ligation independent. Um, with the bacteria, we're going to do that. They're going to use homologous recombination to fill in the gaps um, and then um, stitch it up with ligase and stuff. Um, and so all's good. Um, and you don't have to worry about that. 
but you want to make sure you would have to worry about whether your insert is actually in the plasmid because um, when you're making copies of all of this, we're not doing the purification stuff like we have to do for the um, restriction enzymes, which is another nice thing about this method. But because you're not doing that, um, you're going to have parent plasmid left in there. So you're going to have like the vectors just in there and they're going to have the antibiotic resistance gene. So it would be somewhere else in this plasmid. Because they have that and you're using that to tell you like whether the plasmid got in there, it's not gonna be helpful because if this plasmid gets in here, whether or not it has this insert, it's going to have the antibiotic resistance gene. And so we need to get rid of the parent plasmids. And we can do this with adding DPN1. So DPN1 is a weird restriction enzyme. Um, so instead of being like site specific or whatever, it kind of recognizes methylated DNA and it's going to chew it up. Um, and so what's gonna happen is because you made these, what happens when bacteria, um, when bacteria divide, um, when they when bacteria replicate, they're going to make they're going to modify their bacteria um, with methylation. So bacteria have this sort of like methylase um, restriction enzyme like kind of thing going on where they can protect their own. Um, it's a way that they can kind of like protect their own DNA from getting chewed up by restriction enzymes. Um, and they can also help, the methylation also helps them know like which strands been copied and that sort of thing. Um, so basically what, when the bacteria replicates, when they make copies of um, DNA, they're going to methylate it. Um, and then when they, when we're making, doing it a PCR way though, we're not gonna, it's not gonna methylate. You don't have any methylating things um, in methylating enzymes um, in the PCR mix, that's not going to get methylated. So what's going to happen is that your plas your parent vector is going are going to get chewed up um, because DPN1 is going to recognize and chew up the, um, the plasmid um, that has the methylation, but they're not going to chew up the stuff that is PCR copied because that's not going to be methylated. Um, and so this is going to help you um, make sure that your plasmid um, at least has, is not the parent plasmid. So it has something um, in there hopefully, um, but it we don't know still if the insert is correct. And this is the same with both methods. Um, so you have to confirm that with like DNA sequencing um, or other methods. Um, and so, but in order to, to do this, um, to get the bacteria to stitch it together, you're gonna have to stick it in bacteria. Um, and in the case of even with the other, whatever cloning method you're using, you're typically gonna be sticking in a bacteria and the bacteria then again going to be the, doing the copying. So I just want to say that there are a lot of other cloning methods. Um, and so I do not represent AdGene. I do not work for AdGene. I'm doing get paid for AdGene, but I find the resources on cloning um, and plasmids really, really helpful. Um, and so you can see that they have basic overviews and then a lot more detail on the different cloning types. Um, so there's like restriction enzyme cloning. Another one you might see is gateway um, cloning. This actually involves like recombination. Um, so basically they have recombination sites um, and then they're gonna get recombined um, by the bacteria. Um, and to, um, one that might seem like the most similar to what things that we've been talking about. Um, so like Gibson assembly. Um, and so what this is going to do is it's, it's similar to Slick, um, but it's actually, it's using like a different, um, it uses like a, a different exonuclease and then a polymerase and a ligase. Um, and it, so it's kind of doing more of the stuff outside of the bacteria. Um, it's more expensive than slick. Um, and it uses like these different, um, like their enzymes and that sort of thing. So it's a more expensive thing. Um, I'm not sure whether how it compares to slick in terms of efficiency or whatever, um, but it, it's a similar type of method. Um, but using different enzymes and doing more of it outside of the cell. Another common one um, is like Golden Gate. Um, so this is a, uses these type 2S um, restriction enzyme. And so these are weird that they like cut outside of their sequence. Um, and um, so, but it's, it's a restriction enzyme based, um, but it's different than the other ones because it's cutting outside of the sequence. So it's not leaving like a scar. Um, um, so yeah. 
so and then there's like the ligation independent cloning like this like base things um so yeah so lots more on agi they have like a plasmid 101 um book too and stuff which is really helpful and again um i do not represent or endorse them i just find their stuff helpful um and so people often ask me about other types of cloning as well um and so they all serve so really, um, so they basically have a lot of the same things in mind in terms of how you get your insert, making plots, um, how you get your vector, that sort of thing. Um, so lots of cool stuff. Um, so check out their website if you want to learn more. Whatever cloning method you're using, you're typically going to be sticking in a bacteria, and the bacteria then again going to be the, doing the copying. How we stick it in bacteria um, is typically with transformation with like heat competent cells. So just a terminology note. Um, so we say like transfection is when we're like sticking genetic info into cells. Um, when we do this to bacteria, we call it transformation. Um, when a virus does it, we call it transduction. Um, and outside of um, we don't, it's it's a form of transfection, um, but we don't use the word transformation when we're dealing with things other than bacteria um, because it's too confusing with things like cancer. Um, and um, so we use this um, transfection term in those cells um, instead of transformation. Um, and so, but we use transformation when we're talking about bacteria. Um, common used ways we do this are with chemically competent cells, competent cells in heat shock, or elect, um, you can also use like electroporation, which uses charge. But what I use is this like heat shock, where basically you have these cells that are really weakened, um, and they're coated in like calcium so that the DNA can get really close, and then you kind of flood the DNA in there. You use heat shock to help like open up little pores in the bacteria, and the DNA sneaks in, um, and then it heals itself and grows. And if it has the plasmid, it'll, um, it'll grow. Uh, there are different types of cells that we can stick it into. If we wanna just make copies of the DNA or if we wanna stick it into um, like expression cells. But in any of these cases, um, we have the same issue where we want to make sure that we actually have our sequence afterwards. Um, and so there are things we can do to help um, make sure that we do um, and kind of waste, not waste our time. One thing is um, controls. Um, and so in practice, we don't really do controls that this sort of control that much. Um, if you have, if you're having problems with your cloning, though, you definitely want to use controls. And if you're like new to cloning and that sort of thing, um, and so these are controls that you could do for like a restriction enzyme type. You want to use a positive control that's making sure that your competent cells are actually competent. So these cells like are really weakened. Um, we have to really weaken them in order to get them in that state where they're going to be um, likely to take in the plasmid. Um, and so, but we don't want to kill them. And so you have to be really, really um, careful when working with these cells and like not being, don't hold the tube from the bottom, like hold it from the top and stuff and keep it on ice um, and make aliquots of the cells. So really tiny single use portions on um, the first time you open them and that sort of thing. But because they're so weak, they can like go bad. Um, and so you wanna make sure that the transformation, uh, that the cells are good, um, that your transformation strategy works. Um, and so you want to use like a positive control, so like a plasmid that you know is good. Um, and so then you it'll make lots of copies. Um, and uh, just a note, when you have like a positive control or something that's already like a mini prep something or whatever, it's going to be a lot better, transform a lot better than something like, um, especially with like a slick product or something where you're actually calling saying bacteria please fix up what like fix the ends of these um and so then you're going to have a lower transformation efficiency um which is so you're not gonna you're gonna um want to play a lot less of when you have like a um mini prepped product um but i'm not going to go into that here but basically each of these colonies is going to be um basically just like a clump of genetically identical bacteria um hopefully with your insert um and so this is just going to tell you that, 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 that everything's working. Um, you also want to have a um, cut vector. Um, and so basically you want to have a negative control um, that all the vector got cut. Um, so you didn't have any parent vectors or self-circularized vectors. So these cut pieces aren't going to be able to like replicate and that sort of thing. Um, and so they're not gonna get passed on. So even if they have an antibiotic, then they're not gonna like get, Say um, whatever. And so you shouldn't see any um, colonies, or at least you should just see a really few number. 
Um, this is also, you can use something similar um, for if you're doing like a slick method um, to make sure that you don't have any of the parent that your DPN1 digest works and that sort of thing. So, um, and these are you also, your, un, your negative control should also show that your antibiotics were effective. Um, and so basically you only want things growing that actually have your plasmid. Um, and then you're left with the problem of, well, does my plasmid actually have the right insert? Um, so there are things we can do to see if it has likely has it and then the the gold like the positive like the yes it really does is you have to sequence it we can talk about selection versus screening so selection is like when we are using the antibiotics and saying okay only let the things that have this survive we can also talk about screening um and so screening it's basically, it's just going to show us what probably has it and what probably doesn't, or at least what probably has an insert, not necessarily our correctly spelled insert. Um, so a common example that I talked about yesterday is this blue-white screening, um, where basically if you put you make it so that your insert is actually going into the part of um, this peptide that's needed to make this blue product. And so if you disrupt that, then your colony is going, not going to be able to make the blue product. And so you're going to get those, your colonies will be white. So this is going to help you know, okay, these colonies probably have my insert and the others don't. Um, what's nice about this screening is that it's kind of like a visual look. You don't have to do any work. Um, but you also, um, it also isn't going to tell you anything about like the size of the insert um, or that sort of thing. And so you can get more information about whether the size looks good um, and that sort of thing with like colony PCR or an analytical digest. So a nice thing about colony PCR is that you can actually do it directly from your colony without having to purify anything or amplify anything. Um, you just kind of like break open the cells. And since you're making a lot of copies with PCR, um, you don't need that much DNA. But if you're going to want to do like an analytical digest, um, or if you're going to send it for sequencing for those, you need to um, basically get the bacteria to make lots and lots of copies. And so you take one of these genetically identical, um, these clones which have like genetically identical bacteria in them, basically like that's one bacteria that plopped down um, and make lots of copies on, of itself on top of itself. Um, so you take one of these colonies and then you grow it up in some more media um, overnight, um, let it make lots of copies. And then you break open those, those cells and purify out the DNA using like a mini prep kit. Um, and so that be, this way you're using the bacteria to make the copies. Um, here you're using PCR to make the copies because you need enough copies of something that you can see um, that you can test. Um, and so with the colony PCR, it's actually when you're making the copy, you're only going to make copies if you have the sequence there, um, or at least you're going to make sequence, depending on the primers you use, you might make copies of something. Um, but the size will matter as we'll look at. Um, but with analytical digest, um, we're going to be cutting these pieces. Um, and so we need to have lots of our plasmid. And so we're going to have to do the mini prep first. Um, but the analytical digest and colony PCR can both give you an idea about the, um, like whether the pieces, whether your insert, you have an insert in there, whether the insert is about the right size. Um, if you use like a um, gel to separate the pieces um, and see what size they are and if it makes sense of what you would expect if it did or didn't have the insert. Um, and then in any case, you're going to ultimately, if those pan out, um, then you'll want to send it to sequencing to make sure that it, the sequence is all okay. So an analytical digest, um, this is similarly similar to what we talked about before in the case of you having a restrict, using restriction enzymes. But here, what you're going to do is you're going to basically, you're going to use cuts um, that have a cut site, like in a region with the, um, every one, like you, there are different ways that you can do it, but you can do it so that you have like a cut site, like in your insert um, or not. And you'll have like a different number of cuts if you have the insert or you don't have the insert. And then you'll be able to see like the relative sizes of the pieces. Another method is colony PCR. Um, and so basically here, you're going to design primers and use PCR that are going to make products um, that are going to tell you whether or not the, um, whether or not the insert was in there and then whether it's um, the correct size. Um, but ultimately, if you really want to know whether the sequence is correct, you're gonna have to send it for sequencing. Um, and so this is pretty cheap nowadays. Um, and so basically you use primers um, that are going to go into your um, 
into the sequence um, from like either side and stuff and tell you this, you'll get this chromatograph back um, showing you the sequence uh, more on this and other posts, but you really want to make sure that the ends, um, the ends are the parts that are most likely to be messed up. And so you want to make sure that all of that is okay. And if all of that is okay, um, then you can move on to whatever you wanted to do next. Um, and so maybe you want to then um, do like a um, stick them into expression cells or that sort of thing. If you want to make protein, um, subclone it into other cells. I know you just cloned it, um, but um, like for in our lab, for example, we can then use um, after we do that subcloning, we can then make backmids from it with like. Um, so we clone it into this plasmid that is going to have these um, recombination sites on either side. Um, then we can use, um, put it into, make this baculovirus and that sort of thing. So there are a bunch of things you can do um, depending on what you want, but all in all of these cases, first you had to get it into that original plasmid. Um, and so this is where molecular cloning um, comes to play 